here. Some are black um, and uh, don't want any, any accidents here. Okay, so first speaker is James Davenport. Postdoctoral fellow. I know many people in this room, um, so we'll skip forward. Um, a brief introduction to Kepler, though it needs a little introduction. Uh, Kepler was an exo or is an exoplanet hunting mission. Uh, it stares at one patch of sky for four years, taking an uh, unblinking eye, or it's taking normally 30 minute exposures, uh, which I think sounds really appealing to a lot of us when we talk about flare monitoring. We don't have to go to bed, we don't have to worry about clouds rolling in. We don't have to worry about long flares reaching the end of the night uh, and not knowing what happens at the end of the decay phase. There's a lot of ideal components to Kepler um, in terms of getting statistically complete samples of flares. And, uh, but there's a very limited amount of information we get from the light curves. So this is my simulation of a bunch of star spots uh, with a bunch of little cartoon flares going off. And you can see there's a lot of information about where the flares are in my little ad hoc model about how they cluster around the star spots. Um, all we get is this convolution of all that, right? All we get is this light curve. And worse yet, all we get is a broadband, very red light curve. So we don't have U-band imaging, we don't have uh, near UV. We don't even have B minus V for these flares. We just know there's some very red, large event going on. Uh, but still, uh, we are convinced that these things do happen. So here's my screenshot of the preliminary release from uh, the K Kepa quarter zero data from Luciana Walkowicz, where we saw star spots and flares, and I would say this looks like this, so we're confident that these physical processes are happening, so I get to talk about flares. There's a lot of instrumental systematics we have to worry about when we're processing the Kepler catalog. Um, there are quarter-to-quarter -quarter variations. This is a screenshot coming out of the uh, mass archive where the Kepler data is now stored. Um, and you can see these gaps, these uh, hard uh, discontinuities between quarters, which thankfully are not astrophysical. Uh, there are also longer, more suggestive tra uh, trends that we see in the data, which are typically also not astrophysical. So we need uh, to, to process this data in an automated way. Uh, we need to be able to chew through uh, about 200,000 stars worth of light curves. So that's, that's a lot of data. Um, this is a zoom in on just one quarter, where we believe at least the noise properties are fairly uniform, and still you see this is, again, you still see this coherent long-term trend, which we think is also an instrumental artifact as the spacecraft moves in its orbit. Uh, and we zoom in even further, we start to see, this is, now, this is long cadence data, which is the 30-minute cadence data in the white light. Uh, we can see this quasi-periodic oscillation for the star, that we think this is astrophysical, this is star spots. Uh, and we, the job is to find the flares 
against this signal. And I think there are a couple obvious events. There's a big one here. There's maybe a little shoulder of an event here. There are a lot of smaller, not so obvious events. And we'd like to be able to do this, uh, again, in an automated, hands-free way. We have over 200,000 stars to look at. That's long cadence data. Here's a peek at what the short cadence data looks like. Um, so this is just a small window of time. This is uh, two quarters worth of data. So you can see within a quarter, again, the systematics are smaller. There's a small discontinuity in the middle. Um, but this one minute data, which is much better for flares, still has lots of, okay, so this is the discontinuity, still lots of structure we need to remove in order to identify the flares. And we zoom in again, this is the same star. You can see that sinusoidal modulation is very nicely mapped out, and now we see orders of magnitude more flares. And so we, hmm? Oh, sorry. Don't leave it me. Uh, the dips, yeah, this is, this is the raw data without flags uh, excluded. So there are some cosmic ray rejections and pointing rejection things that need to be taken out, that we take out with flags. So this is the raw data as mass has it. So there are extra structure, yeah. Were there planets, we can see those as well. These pesky planets can, can appear in our data and ruin our flare studies. Um, okay, so the job is to look at four years of the data for about 200,000 stars. And this is just a preview of some of the instrumental and astrophysical systematics that we have to remove or model out so that we can find the flares. Many of these flares, you'll know, are much smaller than the star spot modulation. This is about a 3% star spot modulation here. So this is a 3% increase in the flare flux in the red. This is a pretty big flare um, if it's the size of the star spot. And it can get just dwarfed by the star spot. And we see flares that are much smaller. Okay, here's the fully zoomed in, and you can see just within uh, a fraction of a day, yeah, this is uh, like a quarter of a day, and there are like six really big, prominent, beautiful flares um, right for studying. So this is, this is the, the game. Um, so what I have done uh, in the last year is analyze all of the Kepler data from the original Kepler mission. So this is about three million individual light curve files. That's 3 million light curves. That's 200,000 targets spread out over between months and years of data. Some of it in 30 minutes, some of it in one minute. Some of it goes back and forth between 30 minutes and one minute, depending on who picked the targets that quarter. So this is a lot of data to process. Uh, this is just screenshots of the automated code running, picking out flares, putting little stars and things on them as it finds them. This takes about a week of computation time on the computer cluster that we have access to at Western Washington University. Um, so we're very grateful to have about 500 cores to do this. Uh, still, it takes about a week just to do one run. And as we all know, it takes a half dozen runs to believe anything before we're convinced that we're not just picking up our own feet. Um, the way we get really sure about what we're finding is through artificial flare injection. So here's just a snapshot of a piece of light curve. And let me draw a cartoon of what we do. We inject some series of fake flares. And the flares look a little better than this PowerPoint drawing. Um, they are drawn from a realistic flare model that's a data-driven model of what the flares look like in the Kepler band pass. Um, we span a range of uh, durations and amplitudes, so these flares have a wide range of energies, and we make them go down into the noise limit. So I haven't drawn any flares here small enough. These flares would all be obviously picked out in the cartoon. Uh, we then reprocess all the data with artificial flares ejected. This is exactly analogous to what the exoplanet community has been doing to understand their completeness. Uh, we would cover some, we miss others, we're able to draw some kind of completeness curve as a function of the flare event energy for each star. And we do this for each continuous chunk of the light curve. So when there's a break or discontinuity, the noise properties of the, of the spacecraft can change. Uh, the target moves on, uh, on, on the pixels, on the CCD a little bit, and the noise properties can be very different. So we have to do this many, many times throughout the light curve to believe the flares are picking out within each chunk of the light curve. So we repeat this process again and again. So the results, in short, when we require that a star has at least 100 total flare candidates spread out over four years, and at least 10 of those are above this 68% completeness threshold that is being determined locally throughout the light curve, uh, we find more than 4,000 flare stars in the Kepler data set uh, with a total of 1.4 million what I'll call flare candidates. Now, the algorithm sometimes gets confused with complex flares. It sometimes it splits a complex flare between two events. So there is a little bit of disagreement there with some of the uh, specific flare energies that we've recovered. Uh, still, this is the largest sample of flaring stars, uh, and we should be able to study the aggregate statistics about these stars. So one thing we can do that's very popular is plot 
the uh, occurrence distribution of the flares as a function of their energy. Uh, this has been done for a long time. I think most people in this room have made a plot that looks like this at some point. What you have is there are very few high energy events on the left side. You have a large number of small events in log energy and log occurrence rate. And we see a parallel, a straight line in log log space. Now this star was one we studied a couple years ago by eye. And so we had a very good by eye census of these flares. And thankfully the fit line that I've highlighted in orange is very close within a few percent of the by hand analysis. So we're very happy that we, the automated code picks up the same occurrence distribution. Uh, the red lines and the blue lines are the different subsets of the data, the long and short cadence data, where the noise properties are slightly different. Um, there are some small systematics, especially at the small uh, energy flare end, and you can see that the cutoff in each of these little faint lines is different energy, and that's because of the local uh, completeness limit moving around between different uh, noise properties. So for this, this is an active M4 dwarf. Um, and we get a very constant power loss slope. Here's an example that at least some of you in this room have seen before of a G star um, that shows a nice strong power law at low flare energy, or where low are still super Carrington events by a factor of a few or 10. Uh, and we see this nice uh, statistically significant break. Uh, so these error bars are the Poisson errors, and then include something about the signal to noise. Um, we see a statistically significant break at uh, high flare energies. Uh, and this flare, this star reaches out to the max of the super flares, which is usually peaked at about 10 to the 37. There aren't many flares that are, we found, that are bigger than that. So there's an interesting rollover here, and this has very interesting uh, uh, ramifications for flare occurrence. Uh, and I would really encourage people to go talk to Dave Soderblom, who's thought about this star for a few years, um, and I think has more to say about it than I, other than to, I can say we find a break. Um, so this is something we haven't done systematically, but as Dave said, I think is ready to do that, We're ready to do a systematic study of this flare occurrence frequency distribution and find where these breaks occur um, as a function of spectral type. I uh, haven't done it yet. Um, we can count up just the number of flare stars. So this is our 4,000 flare star sample uh, as a function of G minus I color or temperature, right? So these are low mass stars, the M dwarfs. We go, whew, the M dwarfs flare more. Um, we did a careful job of our Poisson detection errors, the binomial errors here. Uh, so these error bars seem very large, but they are correct. Uh, and many other studies, I think, that have done this uh, haven't published their error bars. And when we compare their occurrence fractions, we get similar errors. But still, there's a coherent uh, evolution. So the end worse, but at most, uh, we're relieved about that. OK, so this has all been wonderful and interesting uh, and was very satisfying to do. Uh, but there has been a lot of other work in stellar astrophysics from Kepler. Uh, and a lot of it has focused on the rotation and there's been a lot of uh, secondary results about differential rotation and spot evolution. But I'm not going to talk about that. We're just going to ingest the rotation information and take it as gospel truth for these stars. So for a large number of the stars, uh, we have a rotation period from the Amy McQuillan uh, 2014 paper, and she had about 30,000 stars with rotation periods. So for uh, something like half of our sample, uh, we have a rotation period for the uh, the flare stars from this 4,000 flare stars. And what we see, and I think this curve looks familiar to a lot of us, this is not a, a, a new result in terms of this shape, what we see is an activity saturation and, and a decay. Let me go ahead and draw a line, and we can argue about whether or not this line is right. Uh, but we, I think we can all agree that this is not a single line to describe this population. We see a saturation regime, and we see a decay regime. The slope of this decay is more shallow than has been seen in like UV, and X-ray uh, is very similar to the minus one slope that has been seen in H alpha in Stephanie Douglas's recent work. The saturation breakpoint, this uh, Rosby number sat uh, breakpoint, uh, is at about 0.03. Now, again, this is debatable. The sample size uh, is a little small, but the canonical value is 0.1, and we can very strongly rule out a Rosby number break at 0.1, at least for these stars. Now, this is late Gs through mid Ms. And so I think a lot of the blurring you're seeing here, a lot of the width of this, is not due to my signal to noise or due to my recovery efficiency. The error bars in this flare activity or flare luminosity plot are very small because there are statistical errors. Uh, instead, I think what we're seeing is a blurring because of the mass. So let's do the fun thing and break it up as a function of mass or spectral type bins. And now I've done a by eye fits in PowerPoint um, where I've just taken the fit before and I've copied it, and then I moved the lines around. Okay, So take this with a slight grain of salt, because this is hot off the press 
circa before I got on the plane to come to Sweden. Um, but we can see what appears to be two minutes, thank you. Appears to be an evolution of this slope. Uh, well, sorry, the slope is constant. Appears to be an evolution of the break. Um, so in the earliest, the G-type stars, we see something that's closer towards the Rosmer 0.1. By the time we get out to the M's, we see essentially no saturation threshold for the flare activity. This is telling us something really interesting. I need smarter people to tell me what it means. Okay, so in the two minutes I have left, uh, we'll talk about the future of this sample. I think it's ripe for analysis. Um, we'd like to understand flare morphology. So this is a shape we get when we stack hundreds and hundreds of flares. We get a very constant shape for a single star. We need to see if this uh, holds for stars of different speckle types. Uh, that's an interesting problem, and we can use that shape to decompose the more complex events. So we've done some of this in uh, a few papers, Holly et al., Davenport et al., uh, 2014, but we'd like to do this as a function of speckle type. This is an interesting problem. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, an angle I'm really excited about is looking at wide binaries. Um, so there's a few hundred known wide binaries in the Kepler field, and uh, when you take the difference in their colors, so these are the even mass, these are the secondary being smaller, and the ratio of that flare activity, uh, I think we naively expect that we would see higher flare activity in the smaller stars. So we would expect some trend here in the ratio of the A to B flare activity. Uh, instead, what we see is noise, uh, which is, again, interesting. Uh, the signal noise on each of these points is quite high. And so I think this is telling us something wacky about where wide binaries come from, which has been discussed uh, in the literature a bunch as well. Um, we can use gyrochronology relations to talk about age. I'll blow through this really quick. Ah, and then the most interesting thing uh, is relating flare rates to activity cycle. It's something I'm really excited about. We've talked about in this conference already. Uh, looking at, uh, say, H and K or sunspot numbers. This is for the sun. We see this flares behave like sunspots. The flare occurrence rate is a very strong measurement. In fact, flare rates or, uh, vary by an order of magnitude on the sun from the active to the inactive sun. That's a measurement we ought to be able to make. <coughs> when the star spots are giving us a lot of noise and we're not sure how to interpret differential rotation and multiple spot signals, uh, a factor of 10 difference in the flare rate is something I think we can pick out. I hope. So let's talk about this, and let's talk about it at Cool Stars 20. And, and, and we can talk about flares in future surveys, like LST, which Suzanne will talk about this afternoon. So stick around all day for more flare science, and I'll take questions. Let's use the mic, just because we want to get the questions. Yeah, we have more questions. OK. It's Thinking about those wide binaries, one of the things I thought about was that in the Kepler field, you have very widely varying rates of flare. You see, you think the maximum energies in flares, say, in G stars, but yeah. you'll see yeah, yeah, yeah. some stars, it's not dependent on rotation, for example. You can find a given rotation period, the stars not doing a thing, you find another one that's going like crazy. And so it makes me wonder whether that flaring might be episodic. And that episodic behavior might itself depend on the age, rotation, or whatever, so you get it more frequently. And that could account for the binaries because uh, you have to give you the noise. That's right. I think uh, we would see that in the white binaries as things even around one and the ratio. I think we do see that. It's a question of do we see it? Uh, is the signal too strong? Yes, that's a good point. I don't see. All right, thanks, Jen. Uh, next speaker is uh, Yuta Notsu, um, talking about super flares on solar type stars found from Kepler data. The detailed content of my talk are also presented in the aposta, so please visit our poster later. <coughs> First, I briefly introduce our discovery of superflares by Kepler Space Telescope data. As discussed in Dr. Damemoto's mighty talk, uh, uh, superflares are flares much more energetic than solar flares. We recently found many superflares, like this one, like this spike, 
on many solar detectors by analyzing both of the Kepler long cadence and the short cadence positive data. And these figures are examples of super events. And these two figures show, as shown in these two figures, super is much larger than compared with uh, ordinary solar flare. And these are also examples of superhead light cards found from Kepler of both, uh, both of the Kepler 30 minutes and 1 minute scale data. And some bigger pairs on the right hand side, uh, right upper side, show the oscillatory features like this one. And we can also find the relatively small superhead like right up uh, down side. Uh, like this by using Kepler 1 minute scale and data. And in total, we found such large number of super pairs on solar pictures. And then in this figure, we plotted the fair frequency distribution as a function of fair yeah. energy. The frequency distribution shows the power of distribution as mentioned by the people, uh, like this, in these energy ranges. And this power is uh, like, uh, roughly similar to that of solar field. Then in, we compare superfair frequency distribution with solar field distribution. As seen in this figure, power distribution of superfairs are consistent with solar fields in these very large energy ranges. And from this figure, <coughs> yeah, we can see how frequently superfairs can may occur on a channel. For example, 10 to the 34 L superfair occur once in 800 years. Then, next, let's see the light curve superfair stars in detail. Most of superfair stars show cozy periodic <coughs> variation like this. The typical period is from one day to a few tens of days. And we and many people consider these brightness variations can be explained by the rotation of the star with the light star spot. And then, uh, the amplitude of these brightness variations corresponding to the star spot coverage. So we can estimate star spot coverage like this, uh, with this way. Then, in this video, we compare flare energy with the uh, star spot coverage. In this figure, we plot flare in the vertical axis of flare energy and as a function of star spot sizes of solar flares and super flares. And as for the data of super flares, uh, the star spot coverage are calculated from the amplitude of the brightness variation. And we can see most of the super stars have large star spots compared with the sun spots. And the, these four lines uh, show the correspond to the magnetic energy stored, stored around the star spot using this equation. We can say flare energy is consistent with the magnetic energy stored around the star spot. However, some of the data points are above these lines, like this, like this one. And we can think these stars have, for example, have low influential angles. And this point was already confirmed by a spectroscopic study. So for the details of this topic, please visit our website. Then we can, from this figure, we can say large, large star spots are necessary for superfair. Then we plot flare energy as a function of rotation period. We can, uh, in this figure, we cannot see clear correlation with uh, rotation period. The energy of the largest flare observed in a given rotation period B does not not have a clear correlation with rotation period. And uh, even slowly rotating stars like the sun, the sun has a 25 days or so, 25 days or so rotation period, uh, also have a large superfluid. So it may, can be said, it can be said superfluid may occur on the slowly rotating star like the sun. But what, then what does the correlation with rotation? The answer is a fair frequency. The flare frequency of superfluid uh, super star decreases as the rotation period uh, increases. And we can also mention the gemstop. We can also see saturation for period range smaller than three days. And these tendencies are similar to the well-known relation between X-ray luminosity and stellar rotation. So the uh, flare frequency has a correlation with rotation period. And this is summary slide. We discovered many superfly events from uh, solar type star data or Kepler, uh, from Kepler data. And we confirmed the frequency distribution of superfairs and uh, such uh, power of function is similar to solar flares. And we compared superfairs with stellar properties. And the maximum energy has a correlation with star spot coverage, but no clear correlation with rotation period. And this suggests that uh, existence of large star spot is an important point for superfairs. But the uh, clear frequency depends on the rotation period. 
だと、まずはリーダーシップを持つことだと選挙でもあり
the three coolest lines we have access to all show a very strong impulsive response. Uh, this is a complex layer with multiple peaks. If we then look at the three hottest lines that we have access to, they show a much weaker response. And if I zoom in, you can see that they also show a relatively gradual decay in comparison to those cooler lines. Now, we can take this one step deeper even and look at the evolution of the line profile for just a single one of those lines. I'm back on the silicon four line again during a flare uh, to look at potential mass motions during the flare event. Now, this is survey data, and we don't just have one flare, we have several flares. So we might want to look at the overall distribution of those flares. There's about a dozen flares in total. And we can make a plot of uh, the energy frequency distribution of those flares. And what we see is that although the slope of this distribution looks somewhat shallower than, so the muscle flares are in blue here, and we have a solar comparison in red, and then the four flare stars I showed in the first slide in green. Um, the slope for the muscle stars looks a little bit shallower, but actually it's statistically the same as the other stars. But we can also see that the muscle stars, although they certainly flare frequently, they flare about an order of magnitude less frequently at a given flare energy than the four flare stars. And then from the perspective of a planet, perhaps the easiest question, but most important question to answer is, what is the energy budget of the emission line flux in these stars? So looking back again at, our, at the light curves, if you spread these flares out over the entire temporal baseline of all 11 stars, then we find that on it, or spread out over those temporal baselines, the flares, depending on the line that you're looking in, contribute from a few percent to a few tens of percent of the total energy that any planet around the stars would be receiving. So it's significant, but it's not dominating the energy budget of line emission in the ultraviolet. So with that, I'll leave you with some conclusions. These flares, or sorry, these stars do flare pretty frequently. Um, and we see a power law distribution that's roughly consistent with other flare stars and the sun. Um, the coolest lines we have access to show the strongest response, whereas the coronal lines in nitrogen 5 show a little bit more gradual response. Uh, and they contribute significantly to the energy budget. They leave us, with some, leave us with some open questions like, what are the particle flux rates associated with these flares? And are we seeing coronal responses to all the ultraviolet responses that we see? And what's the effect on planets? All right, thank you. Question. Would you go back to the plot of the power wheel? Yeah. What's with the sun? How does it just keeps on going at high energy? At high energy here. Yeah, it flattens out, it doesn't turn off. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have an answer to that question. I pulled these data from, they come from a catalog that. Uh, was made from the EVE instrument uh, for carbon-3 flares in the extreme ultraviolet on the sun. And so I don't know why the distribution lines out at the high energy ranges. Who's paper that? Who's the author of this? Rachel Hawk. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Rachel Hawk, just to repeat that with the speakers. Hey, thanks a lot, Bart. Uh, so one of the goals of this splinter session is to identify common problems in flare physics uh, for solar and stellar flares. Um, and what we can do about those problems with um, large volumes of um, away in survey data. And so we want to learn 
um, from the solar experience. Uh, the next talk um, is an invited talk, uh, Juan Carlos Martinez Oliveras, uh, talking about um, white light flares in the sun um, observed with SDO HMI. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers for the Oh, Hello? 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 That's better. That's better? Yeah. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to be here. And I will going to talk about SDO HMI flares. And, and I actually feel like a, a black sheep in this room. <laughs> so it makes me nervous. Uh, and in particular, I'm going to talk about the associated phenomena that we see with these flares in the solar corona and the solar chromosphere. Uh, this is a work that I have been doing for the last years with my two main colleagues, Hugh Hudson and Sam Crocker. So here is kind of an overview of what I understand about white light flares and their association with hard X-rays in the sun. What we know is that white light flares are enhancements of the white light continuum from the sun associated with the impulsive phase of a flare. We understand that from the 1970s that these flares usually are associated with high energy electrons that are being accelerated from the flare side. Hugh Hudson in 1972 suggested that all these emissions in the hard X-ray and the white light are correlated with electrons that are higher than 10 kV. The electrons are going to be observed in the way that we observe it is by indirectly observing hard X-rays coming from the lower atmosphere. So we're in the corona, that's what we believe. Um, but there are other ways to produce white light emission. In this, in one of the mechanisms that is suggested is backworm emission. When you heat the chromosphere will warm up and generate the, the ultraviolet emission, and that will heat the photosphere, generating white light emission. Um, one of the questions that we have is where exactly these two are produced, where the hard X-ray and the white light are being produced. So the, if they have, both of them are being produced by the same peak target, then you are going to have, if I had a pointer, it says that the question is, that both come from the chromosphere or somewhere somewhere in between, between the chromosphere and the photosphere, and will share the same kind of source. If white warming is true, then what you're going to see is a hard X-ray source and then something below that will be the white light source. Here is an example seen by HMI and by FDO of a white light flare. The white light contour, the white contour in there is the HMI, the heliocytic and magnetic images intensity continuum image. And the image on the background is a 1600 AIA image. So you can clearly see that the foot point coincides on two different white light ranges. This is the HMI image. So you can clearly see the two kernels that we were observing in time domain. So this is just four frames, and each frame is 45 seconds. So you can clearly see starting the flare, here, the, here at the bottom you have the maximum of the flare and there's the decay, the decay phase. Um, so we, here is a blown up of this, already with the RESI images. So we have the possibility to do images in hard X-rays with the RESI spacecraft. So what you have in here is the white light kernels that I showed you below, above, before, and then in blue, in, see, in blue, what you have is the X-ray sources. They nicely coincide. The thing on top of them is the loop, the thermal loop observed by Resi. Here is a bigger, so you can see that these two sources or emissions do coincide spatially, although there are some, some misalignments at the bottom. The white light, this dashed line that you have in there is the position as seen by the stereo EUBI that was observing almost 90 degrees from the from the length. Just here is the observation seen by stereo. The 
flat line in there is the limb, the solar limb as seen from the Earth perspective. And these things that uh, is saturated in the wave. So what we did was to compute the centroid of emission of that saturated image to calculate the height of formation of this flare, the two different heights. And we obtained the follow. The follow is that the flare, the heat rays and the white light emission was produced at about 400 kilometers above the photosphere, the bottom of the photosphere, or, or the base of the photosphere. This is extremely low. This is not predicted by the model. So this result has been with some degree of contingency in the, in the solar community. The standard idea is that the X-ray is being produced at about one megameter at the surface. So we decided that one flare is not enough. So we need to do more flares. We made a catalog of flares during, during the SDO era. At this point, we have analyzed from 2011 to 2013. We have only 229 flares. 79 of those are white light flares. A third of them are lint flares, that is the ones that we use for this kind of analysis. 16 of them have some kind of off limb event, and I will show later what it is. Three of these flares were used by Crocker et al. to determine also the heights. So what you can see here, see there, well, somewhere in the numbers in there, is that the heights that Crocker et al. found is about 800 kilometers. So it's not as high as predicted by the model, and it's not as low as we found before something in between. Uh, but it's still, it's not predicted by the model. These are the three examples that they use for the flare. The red contours and blue contours are the um, resi clean image. Later uh, this year, there was a nice study by Mate Kuhar. He studied 43 M-class and E-class flares. Uh, what he did was he studied the light curve, so that I can, find, I can show you a light curve. Uh, during the position, and what he found is in general, this is consistent, and all the white light flares and X-rays seems to be co-special. That means that most likely back warming is not the result of doing this. Here's an example of a white light flare seen by stereo. So you are going to see the white light flare. Come, you can see nicely the, the ribbons going out. So usually people to make these studies use what is called a difference, difference running, a running difference. And what we did is to increase the contrast. When you increase the contrast, then you start seeing things moving up in HMI data, like a mini CME going up. So this is a nice example of what you can do with an instrument that was not designed to observe anything in intensity continuum, and even more to use it as a coronagraph. <laughs> Here is a series of images of these. You see the, the loop prominent system, as the Hughes Hudson call it. Then you have the, on the top the, the magenta is the HMI and the rest is 6 to 15 KE. So you can see that they don't match. You're, that they match nicely with the 1500 AIM <coughs> image. And, oops, sorry. And it does not match with the 193 Armstrong and yeah, image. So this kind of hint that this kind of loopy structure that we see in HMI is not uh, hot. It should be certainly cold. Well, colder than that plasma. We did an analysis of the spectrum because the, the way that HMI does work is that it takes six filters, six filtergrams, six images around the, the central line. So you can reconstruct the spectrum of that. So we did it, and we found that some kind of jet structures in there have a, an emission line. The loop points, they have an emission, they are in emission, but these look like the structures, they're flat. They don't, they don't have any circular polarization. Later on, a, a paper from Pascal saint we we demonstrated that these have a line for linear polarization in the same direction of the limb, that is what you are going to expect from Thompson scattering. So here are my conclusions. Uh, do, all, do all solar flares have a white light flare emission? We think in the results that we have so far, the answer is no. The question is why? It seems like the answer is instrumental. We, I, well, that's what I believe at this point. 
last week at the Solar Physics Edition meeting in Boulder, it was shown that this cadence is actually too, too long. We need to go to shorter, even shorter things to start observing more work right there. Uh, we found also that the heart experience and the white light emission is, is uh, quite special. We need to improve in our techniques to properly image things in heart X-rays and detect the white light flares. And besides all these nice plots and all that, white light flares still is a mystery for us. We don't understand them. Okay, thank you. But if I was a skeptic, a very skeptic, I will not claim that that is fair. Because it had the same variation as you see in the sun spot. I will not claim it. But they did. Okay, thanks very much, Antonis. <coughs> My next speaker is uh, Chloe Thieu, who will talk about quasi periodic pulsations and stellar flares. periodic pulsations are and why we're interested in them. So they're essentially quasi-periodic time variations in the intensity of light emitted by a flare, usually in the decay phase. So the figure there shows quite a famous example. This is the same flare observed in a variety of different wave bands, and you can see it's nicknamed the Seven Sisters flare, as you should be able to make out um, seven distinct peaks in the decay phase. So in solar flares, QBPs can be used to determine uh, physical parameters of the flaring region. And we can also detect them in some stellar flares. And in stellar flares, they provide evidence that the underlying physics is similar to that in solar flares. So in terms of what causes QPPs, uh, there are two popular groups of possible mechanisms. The first is based on uh, MHD oscillations, which can either be of the flaring structure itself or of a nearby structure. And the other is based on load-unload mechanisms. And this is where you have a continuous buildup of magnetic energy, and then when some threshold energy is surpassed, magnetic reconnection occurs, that releases energy, and the process repeats roughly periodically. So here's an example of one of the observations. So the plot on the left shows just the decay phase uh, light curve of a flare. And here I fitted it uh, in red, shown in red, uh, with a simple exponential decay function. Then if we subtract off that fit, we get the plot on the right. Um, they can see roughly a couple of pulsations at the start. Unfortunately, it is quite noisy. However, we can apply a couple of techniques to try and uh, reduce the noise and try and see if there are any oscillations in there. 
So the first of those is to do a wave that transform, and the result of that is shown on the left there. So here you can see a bright feature at a period of around 30 minutes, and that lasts for around 100 minutes. And the other thing we can do is um, an autocorrelation function, which is where you correlate the signal with itself as a function of time lag, and that's shown on the right there. And there we can fit that quite well with just a simple decaying cosine wave, and the result of that bit gives a period of 29 minutes for this flare. So the final stage of the analysis um, is to fit the flare decay along the QPPs all in one go. And for this flare, that gives us a period of 29.1 plus minus 4 minutes. So after going through all of the short cadence Kepler data um, to search for flares showing evidence of QPPs, I found a total of 56 flares with QPP-like signatures. And of those, 11 have what I call um, stable decay oscillations. So for these, the, the QPP is just like a simple sinusoid, which is doubt, um, meaning that we can fit a simple model to them. So these four plots are scatter plots of the QPP period with very stellar parameters. So we've got stellar uh, effective temperature, stellar radius, rotation period, and surface gravity. Um, the red points are the ones which are classed as having stable decaying oscillations, uh, whereas the black points are just all the, all the other flares with the QPPs. And you can see that none of these plots show any sort of correlation, but that's fine because this implies that the QPPs are not due to uh, sort, of, sort of global oscillation at the start and are instead due to some sort of local phenomenon like on the sun. So this um, is just another plot that I made, which is the QPP period against the flare energy. Again, there's no correlation there, but again, this is consistent with solar flares where we have a wide variety of QPP periods and they don't seem to relate to the flare class. So now I'll talk a bit more about those 11 flares, which I class as having stable decaying oscillations. Uh, one thing I noticed is that, uh, whereas it's more usually to um, assume an exponential damping of the QPPs, some of them were better fitted with a, a Gaussian damped case, or a Gaussian damped model. So the two figures here just show um, examples of the two different cases. So the left one was better fit by an exponential damping QPP model, whereas the right hand plot was better fit with Gaussian damping. So after um, producing all those fits, I've uh, produced this scatter plot, which is the QPP decay time uh, against the QPP period. The points in black uh, are those uh, flares of QPPs that were better fitted with an exponential damping case. So those did not show any, any uh, statistically significant correlation. However, there's only five points there, so that's probably, we just need a bigger uh, data set. However, the, the points in red, which are the Gaussian damped QPPs, uh, do show a significant correlation. And if we do a, a simple fit, um, linear fit in log log space, we get that expression uh, at the bottom there. And that expression is very close to the decay time being proportional to the period. And this is consistent with solar theory and observations. And it's due to uh, damping due to resonant absorption for uh, MHD kink waves or thermal conduction for MHD longitudinal waves. And just to note that the different density contrast between the coronal loop and surrounding plasma uh, results in the two different damping profiles, so it's the same mechanism. So I'll just leave a summary slide up there. Uh, thank you for listening, and I'll pass to take any questions. Is there any minimum energy uh, for a flare to uh, show these QPP signatures? Um, I think it might depend on how bright the star is in terms of like the minimum energy of the flare. That you can but on the sun, um, I think it's just the detection limit. It's whether you can see the QPPs above the noise levels, um, but not as far as I'm aware. Thanks, Chloe. <laughs> Last speaker before the break, Peter Heinzel, be talking on the behavior of light curves of solar and stellar flares. I'm going this one. Yes. Yeah, yeah, they'll switch here. This thing has led me to you. It's on? All right, try it. Hello? Oh, yeah, of course. better. Okay. 
Capcom. So I will turn to some different topic, which is the spectroscopy uh, solar and star class using spectral lights, different spectral lights. This work is uh, part of the big project of European F-Chroma, which uh, Anne Kalinski will speak about after the break. Uh, I will start with an example from the work of Adam Kowalski and his colleagues showing the light curve, so time variations of, uh, of uh, total integrated light intensities of different lights. You see H alpha, Balmer lights, calcium lights, and so on. And what is very interesting on this plot is that during the impulsive phase, you see the steep rise in Balmer lights, for example, and they peak and they go down during the gradual phase, but for example, if you look at calcium line, uh, calcium 2K, so these blue dots, you see much slower increase, and then the line peaks much later, so the peak is delayed behind the Palmer lines, and then it goes down. This is a very <coughs> typical behavior, which was uh, already found uh, in many cases, in many flares, it was published many times, and there were some attempts to explain this uh, gradual behavior of these uh, flares theoretically by doing some relative transfer modeling. But uh, to my best knowledge, uh, I, I think this is not uh, satisfactorily explained yet, this kind of behavior. So I would like to show you how the sun does behave in this respect, how the spectral lines of the sun look like. It, uh, it uh, looks quite different from stellar cases. Just to add another light, so magnesium two lights, H and K, which are observed in ultraviolet, I put here one example. The same behavior at calcium lines, the peak is delayed behind, behind the Palmer lines, and the rise is much slower than, than, than impulsive phase. So, concerning the sun, I can show you some nice high dispersion spectra from uh, our observatory in Czech Republic, Montreal. So this is the classical slit spectroscopy. You see spectra in Balmer lines, also in calcium, uh, <coughs> calcium H line and uh, infrared lines. And if you make the light curves of this for this particular flare, you see them on these panels. And uh, especially if you look, for example, in the red curve, which is H alpha line, Maybe it's not so well visible. And blue curve is a calcium K line. So you see pretty similar behavior, uh, time evolution, light curve. So there is no signature of some hub or some peak later on in the gradual phase, like we have seen before on a de Leoni star. Then we made another experiment. We took some photographs in H alpha and in calcium line and we integrated all light from the whole flare, time dependent, and we produced the light curves of that. And again, the result is similar. You see on the top panel, you see uh, 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 the black curve is H alpha, and the red curve is, uh, is a calcium K line, and the correlation is quite good, and there is no signature of some differences in the gradual phase, and it correlates very well with Boris X-rays. And finally, what we are doing now is something interesting because in, in stellar spectroscopy we do have a lot of uh, low dispersion spectra covering the wide range of wavelengths and from that we can derive the light curves. This is not the case of current solar spectroscopy, the flares. Usually people take a spectra of a few lines, H alpha, calcium, B3 line and so on, with the slit spectrograph but you don't cover the whole flare and the whole evolution with, uh, with many lines and continua. So we introduced a low dispersion spectroscope spectrometer in our observatory, and we just select the whole active region. It is shown above with, with the white circle. So the white, white circle shows the region which was selected to integrate all the line from it. So we do something like uh, uh, the sun as a star observation, but it is not the whole disk, because if we would take the whole solar disk, it would be 
the contrast would be very low. So we take just only small region around the flare. And here you see an example of low dispersion spectra in the wavelength region, which is uh, usually used on star spectroscopy from Barnard jump up to 4,500 angstroms, up to H high gamma. You see nice two peaks of calcium lines. This is the, just the spectrum of the flare minus the white sun. So this is something which we will also use one minute. <laughs> but I have 12 minutes, no? In total, not six, <laughs> according to the program. <laughs> I, I, okay, I will finish. I, I thought I have 12 minutes according to the program. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a mistake, but... It's a mistake. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I made my talk for 12 minutes. Okay, I will do it more quickly. So I will skip this movie. It was movie from Minora, you know it. Here I want, what I want to show you, uh, and this is something which is uh, maybe speculative, but it can be something very important. Uh, so far, all modeling of these impulsive phases of flares, stellar flares as well as solar flares, we do it using some radiation hydrodynamics simulations, codes, 1D, and this basically simulates the, the flare ripples. But here you see nice image of flare from, from Hinoden Solar Optical Telescope, and you see nicely two ribbons, but between them you see a lot of uh, cool, cool loops which emit in the calcium line. So what is what is what now? What do we actually see on the sun and from the stars? Here, this is the histo uh, not histogram, but it is uh, it is the plot of the total emission from all pixels from this Hinode image, and you see the light curve in calcium line. This is the full line. But if you plot only the pixels which correspond to the loops, you get this dashed line. And it's very interesting. Uh, it is much lower. So the importance of these pixels is, uh, is much lower compared to the whole flare from the sun. But you see that it starts to increase later than normal peak. And there is a peak which is delayed by, by 20, 30 minutes. So this reminds something what happens on stars, possibly. Then this is a famous picture. Here, I don't know, I, uh, Arek Radetzky will speak about this EFRAMA project. I wanted to show you some uh, simulations which we recently did with uh, Radin code and Flarix. These are two radiation hydrodynamic codes which are currently used by Adam, by, by other people in, in, in Seattle, in, in, NASA Goddard and Flarix is the code which was developed at uh, our institute. And with Mats Carlson we did comparison. I just want to show you this nice result we spent in the last few months with that. And this is one simulation of electron beam heating. And you see the temperature and electron density after 16 seconds of simulations. And this was done to test the robustness of these codes. And you see very nice agreement between between these two simulations. So this is what is normally done for ribbons. But if you have these big loops about that, so how they can contribute to the, to the emission, to the flux of, of stars, are they important or not? You see on cool stars you may have big loops. And uh, then of course it will be quite related to the cooling time. So you have evaporation you get hot loops, evaporated plasma, and then it cools down, depending on density, of course. So you have different cooling times, depending on the density. And finally, you arrive at cool loops, cool loops which are seen on the sun, H alpha, calcium, and so on. But the question is how they actually cool down these loops, not the ripples, yes? And this may give some hints for for explanation of this rather strange behavior of stellar flares. So here is a small cartoon. On the left, you see classical 1D uh, modeling of flare ribbons, 1D atmosphere with the radium code, flare code, and so on. But on the right, you see the structure of the loop, which is first it is illuminated from the surrounding, strongly illuminated. So this is completely different geometry, completely different boundary conditions. From the sun, we know that there are strong flows, downflows, 
in full loops, H alpha loops, you have down flows 100 kilometers per second or even more. So this also must affect strongly the line emission, for example, through the flare brightening, the flare dimming effect. So the idea is to try, and this is actually the project we started recently, to try uh, numerical simulations of such loops and to see whether this can give us some hints uh, for explanation of this, uh, of this uh, strange behavior of stellar spectra. So this is the conclusion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Peter. Thanks for being a good sport. Sorry about the mis misprint there. So sorry. <laughs> Time for a question? I try to be fast. You're good. Thanks. Question? Um, so, Juan Carlos showed um, loops, flow loops in HMI. Um, do think there's anything. And you, you showed that there are calcium 2 loops also that had more of a gradual response. Do so you think that will help understand the two time scales? Yeah, you mean loops from HMI? Yes. have been shown before. Yeah, but. Yeah. Okay, I don't know what is the relation between them, but, uh, but uh, probably these uh, loops uh, in, in, from HMI, this white light emission. To me, it looks like uh, like uh, chromospheric emission. So the question is, what is the mechanism of this emission? Somebody said it's not black warming, but it can be. Maybe we can discuss it in the panel later on what can be the emission in these HMI loops. What, what is the physical reason for that? OK, um, let's thank the speakers in the first half of the session. We have a short break. Um, we'll reconvene at uh, 3.50 or 15.50. Not a joke. Yes,